despite the fact that we've been gone for a couple of weeks, um, we are going to pick this up and right where we left off and hopefully uh, not lose anyone's uh, in the continuity of that. Um, now, uh, in verse number 15, it starts off saying, according to the Lord's word, and it's just a, uh, just a technical thing, but I really don't like that translation because if you, if you read that in the English, according to the Lord's word, what do you, what do you think when you hear that, when you see that? You think that you're probably going to, that this is probably referring to some other place in the scripture, some other word that you'll find in the word of God, and that's really, that's really not there in the original, that's not what there is there in the Greek at all. In fact, the way that it's phrased in the, in the Greek, um, it's basically, uh, it, it's, well, literally it would say this, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. Now that's vastly different, isn't it? For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that's a whole lot different than according to the word of the Lord. Because according to the word of the Lord, you think somebody is expounding upon Scripture. Uh, that's not what's happening here. What's happening here, it seems to me, is almost more prophetic in the, in the sense that, that what's being claimed here, this is the way I see it anyhow, is something that is revelatory, that the Holy Spirit is speaking through Paul to these Thessalonians something that not necessarily was ever said before. And in fact, that really is the case. Uh, I mean, this the revelation that's involved in, in what he's talking about here really uh, has never been made known. This is, this is almost like opening the, the present under the tree on Christmas morning, right? Uh, <laughs> you're, about, you're about ready to have something that is fresh and unique and new and surprising perhaps that's more the flavor there so I think it's unfortunate that the NIV translated that phrase in that way because it really puts across something that I don't think was intended to be uh, and maybe it doesn't mean all that much in the last uh, about how we interpret this you know what enough of this not tonight <laughs> take that go uh, <laughs> it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't maybe change the the perspective of what we're talking about all that much, but it is something. I think things should be accurate when it comes to the Word of God, and I think that translation should be accurate, and I think teaching should be accurate. I think it should be in harmony and agreement with the original text as much as we understand or know what that is. And uh, this is just one of those cases where it isn't, and it just kind of like is a. I don't know, a little thorn sticking in my paw. <laughs> and uh, I don't like it, and I, I want it to be right, and so I endeavor to make it right. But I do think that it is important uh, even more than that, just because we do need to see here that the Apostle Paul is in, in his apostolic authority and in his gifts that he has in the Holy Spirit. He is speaking something here that really is not spoken anywhere else except maybe we could say by the Apostle Paul as well in, in some of that section in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But really, this is a fresh revelation. So having said that, he goes on to uh, talk about it according to the word, for we say to you by the word of the Lord um, that those who are still alive, and that you know we looked a little bit at that uh, in passing by at, in our earlier times, that's basically saying that those who are surviving, those who are still uh, uh, um, alive here on planet Earth when the Lord comes back. Uh, now, in saying it this way, um, there's a couple of thoughts there, of course. Number one is it means that by the time that it happens, some people that he's talking to will not be alive. Um, and I only say that because, you know, you realize that a lot of folks said, say things like the return of the Christ was really anticipated as occurring not too long after Jesus ascended. And that the early church had a doctrine that had expected Jesus to be there at virtually any minute. And I do think that there was ex expectation, no doubt, uh, in the early church um, that could be construed along those lines, 
But I also see that there's plenty of things that are spoken at that point in time about the return of Christ and about, you know, what was likely to happen from when they were speaking to the time that Christ would return, in which some period of time was envisioned. And I think that's, that's kind of in between the words here, you know, the, in between the lines, if you will, is that if he's saying that some are going to be dead and some are going to be surviving, he's talking about the time that it takes for that to happen. I mean, in other words, uh, he's not, as he says this to the Thessalonians, want, wanting them to think in terms of Jesus is coming tonight, Jesus is coming tomorrow. Um, and, you know, there is, I remember in Bible college, um, one of my, my professors uh, in talking about the particular issues here at Thessalonians said that, that in his mind the way that he saw it is that you had a bunch of Thessalonians, you know, not working anymore, sitting in a hill with white robes waiting for the return of Christ. Um, and he says that mainly from a historical standpoint. We've had groups like that uh, throughout the history of the church, right, that they got really fixated on the return of Christ and, and being so fixated, they basically thought that they could disengage from the life of this world and, you know, just welcome Christ when he was returning. And um, uh, really, to tell you the truth, a lot of what we've already looked at in the first uh, four chapters kind of does carry that kind of thought that Paul's trying to correct people that might not you know, be working, that might be idle, that might not be uh, treating each other right, that might be doing a number of things, mainly because they're, they're kind of detaching themselves from all of those regular necessities of life because, you know, they're, they're waiting on the Lord. Uh, and so uh, putting something like this in here, it just kind of helps us see that, that, that some space was in mind. It, it is, you know, there's not saying there was thousands of years in mind, but there was, there was a, a sense that, you know, this is not going to happen overnight. Um, would Paul have seen us, all these, you know, 2020, uh, waiting on the Lord? Uh, I doubt it, but at the same point in time, uh, he didn't see it as something that was occurring at the very moment that he was writing here to the Thessalonians. So, uh, having said all that, we'll keep on moving. Don't want to get bogged down in that. Um, he says that... Uh, um, that what's going to be happening here uh, is that, that um, there will be there, uh, those who are still alive, uh, but they will not precede those who are dead. Uh, this kind of fits in with what he had said in just a few verses before our readings tonight, where one of the things that he wanted to do with the Thessalonians is, is make them understand that, that we don't have the same feeling toward death uh, amongst our brothers and sisters in the Lord that the world has uh, in regard to those that they love and that, that die. Remember he said that they have no hope. Well, we have, we have a hope, and it's not something that we are, you know, that is uncertain. It's, it's something that is absolutely guaranteed. And so our hope is not shaky, but our hope is something that is, uh, is expectant. And so, um, because we have that kind of approach, and we, we might wonder um, if, if the Lord Jesus is coming back for the surviving, what of, what of the dead? Well, uh, Paul says that they're not going, to, uh, not going to be forgotten. It's not like dying somehow or another prevents them from having the experience of, of God's victory or of God's fulfillment of all his promises. In fact, he says they're actually going to experience those things in a matter of speaking first. So, what he says first, now in the Greek, you know, that's, that's a feeling that we have, or that's the word that's used here. Uh, but um, in, in using this word, uh, it does mean something that is uh, uh, on a time basis first. Uh, it, it is certainly included, or that's, that uh, degree of meaning is certainly included in the word. Uh, but the most important thing is that it's about a, a logical precedent. And the only reason I say that is that in the next uh, phrase uh, where it says that they will certainly not precede those who, have, uh, 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 who are fallen asleep for the Lord himself will come down. 
And then he talks about all the things that are going to happen, and he says the dead will rise first. After that, he says, in verse number 17, we who are still alive in, and remain will be caught up together with them. And that after that, in the Greek, is something that, that means um, at once. And so when you put those two thoughts together, that the dead in Christ are going up first, uh, but we who are alive and remain are getting caught up at once. Um, the thought there for us to, to be able to uh, grasp a hold of is just this, is that these things are happening virtually in, in synchronicity. There, there's, you know, there's hardly first and then second, you know, like we were singing some songs a little earlier. One of the things that you have in music is a little notation called rest. You know, one, two, three, you know, a rest, you know, waits. And there's, there's a pause, maybe in vocalization or maybe in a certain instrument, depending on, you know, what part's being looked at. But there's a succession and you, you're waiting for something afterwards. Uh, that's not what's, what's in, 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 uh, in view here. It's not that the dead in Christ rise and then you have a couple of rest in the music song of Jesus' return and then the live and, and uh, surviving and get caught up together with him. This is really meant to convey something that's happening like that. And by the time you start the snap of fingers, the dead are going up. By the time you end the snap of fingers, those who are alive and remaining are going up. So this is something that's going to happen very fast. Hey, people ask me questions about this. They'll say, you know, are we going to see dead people going up by us? Because it says they'll go up first, right? And I, you know, I say, no, that's not really, that's not really what's conveyed in the words. And this is the only place in the Bible that describes this. So this is what we have. This revelation, that's why I got mad at that phrase, incidentally. I mean, this is the revelation that we have from God on this subject matter. And what it says is that, is that, that this is all something that's going to be happening virtually at the same time. The dead aren't going first. That's very true. But it's not like there's a long delay or a long pause before the rest of us are going up with them. And in fact, uh, it's, it's, so, uh, it's so close in, in sequence that it's at once. So uh, it, it's following quite quickly. So anyhow, uh, the, the dead in Christ, uh, we are told, uh, will proceed uh, those that, uh, that are, are surviving. And so there's no need to feel like the dead somehow or another are getting cheated or the dead somehow or another have missed some opportunity or some chance for blessing or anything else like that. Um, we all experience it. Now what we're talking about here ultimately is the rapture. And, and uh, I, I know I've talked about this before in other, uh, in other venues, but uh, let me talk about it a little bit tonight, even if it's just a little bit off of the, uh, the phrases that we're dealing with right now, then, then we can catch back into them uh, as soon as we're done with this. Uh, it's, it's important for us to understand what a rapture is. Um, if I were to describe and define biblically a rapture, I would say that the salient feature, the most important, most noticeable, uh, the most uh, uh, important factor that would identify a rapture, it would be the quality of the rising of the dead. Right? The rising of the dead. Uh, why do I say that? Because usually when we talk about rapture, uh, the notion that we have, at least in the, the, you know, the popular teaching of, uh, of the evangelical church, uh, we're, we're always talking about the living getting raptured. Uh, but the thing about the thing about uh, the rapture that I think uh, it's th that it's helpful to understand that helps you identify such experiences in the Bible that helps you put together the various passages of prophetic scripture that talk about it is this feature is the rising of the dead. This is this is what really marks out uh, the rapture. So uh, here we have it in talking about the rapture, rising the dead. They will go first. Uh, but also, when you get into the book of Revelation, uh, and remember me talking, this, now this might have been three or four weeks ago. Maybe it was two weeks ago. I don't know. I know I talked about it. Um, 
Uh, but when I talked about the fact that I believe in three raptures, right, and why in the world, you know, why in the world do I believe in something that seems to add such a level of complexity to something? I mean, the old scientific rule is, of course, that that you know, Occam's razor, that the 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 simplest explanation is the best. Uh, well, here's the thing: the simplest explanation may be the best. But it also still has to, it has to convey accurately what the Word says. So when it comes to theology, when it comes to interpreting the Bible, I mean, we don't want to use the, the text of the Word of God as a springboard to jump into a realm of complication and philosophical abstractions and things of that nature. We don't want to go that way. You know, in that respect, simply what the words say are better than a whole lot of complication and abstraction that just confounds and uh, obfuscates what's going on. So in that respect, true. But in, in talking about something about the, like the rapture, uh, the fact of the matter is, is that it may seem complicated that there's more than one of these experiences, but it's not complicated at all if that's what the text says. So if the text says that, then it's not a complication to acknowledge that text. It would be an error to try to simplify those things and to summarize those things and to mush them together even if they're not talking about the same thing. I say all that to say this. Why in the world do I see three raptures? Well, I see three distinct periods that the scriptures talk about that, can, that are impossible to see as talking about the same event and they all wrap around the rising of the dead. You have one right here, the rising of the dead. Very clearly discussed here in this passage of Scripture, very clearly uh, elucidated as far as what's going on. Jesus is going to come back in the skies, the trumpet's going to sound, and the dead are going to rise. The dead in Christ, I should say, are going to rise. Hallelujah, amen. I'm looking forward to that, right? But we also have in the scriptures, especially when we get to Revelation chapter 11 and chapter 12, where we start talking about the, the ministry of the two witnesses, we find out there that we have another one of these experiences. And that experience is not, it's not described this way. It's not connected with anything else like those of us who are alive and remain. It's not connected with a trumpet, the shot of an archangel. It's not, a, it's, not, um, it's not associated at all with, with, with believers having been in, in a place where they were uh, participating with the same thing that these two witnesses were and that they were waiting on this. So in other words, you go to the Revelation, you see this, this, the ministry of the two witnesses and what happens to them and how is anything in that description fittable, <laughs> if I can make up a word, right? How's it fittable with the details that are described here? And it isn't. What happens with the two witnesses is that they are killed by the Antichrist in the midst of wrath. We know that we are not appointed unto wrath, right? That's what the book of Hebrews tells us. So it's we're not appointed unto wrath. And this is after Revelation chapter 7 that tells us that the great host of tribulation saints are in white robes and they're with the Lamb uh, in His temple, right, or uh, with Him anyhow, and they are singing songs and their space seems to be eternal. So how is it then that anyone can confuse what's being said in chapter 11 about people dying and rising and going up into the air? How can they confuse that with what's talked about here? Well, they can because, in their mind, they have a longing for simplicity. It's complicated for these two things to be talking about two different things. It's more simple that they should be talking about the same thing. But the longing for sim simplicity is a fool's errand if it's not faithful to the text. And these texts do not talk about the same thing, and there's just no good way to fit them together. It's better off and suddenly meaning comes out if you let them speak for themselves and take them at their, at their word 
And when you do that, you say, well, this seems to be a, an event unique to itself, and that event seems to be unique and to itself. And as crazy as it sounds, I guess they refer to two different experiences that could be called raptures. All right. True enough. Still with me? <laughs> and then we have that really intriguing spot right at the end of time. We get to the end of the tribulation period. Jesus has come back. Suddenly, we are told he's getting ready to set things up. And the those who have given their lives rather than take the mark, right? They're raised from the dead. They're raised from the dead. Now, that particular passage of scripture is very, well, I think that the uh, passage with the two witnesses very clearly in the middle of the tribulation period, but the dead who did not take the mark very clearly at the end of the tribulation period. And then, <laughs> I think for most evangelicals, they clearly see what we're looking at here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is clearly occurring before the tribulation period starts. And so you basically have these descriptions all dealing with the central concept of the rising of the dead, but from the context in which these descriptions are found, they seem to be referring to very different respects or very different aspects or very different circumstances. Uh, so when we get to the end of time, and those who did take the mark are raised from the dead, we have no mention of the Gentile saints, we have no mention of of, well, you don't even have the Jewishness of the saints mentioned, although I think that's what, it, what they actually are. But you have no mention of the details of believers, uh, you know, waiting in faith and trying to, to um, uh, welcome the Lord back in any, any way that would make sense with what Matthew says about one being at a mill, one taken, one left, one, one being um, in the field, one taken, and one left, or this passage of Scripture where we who are alive and are, are, are waiting for the Lord suddenly we all go up right after the dead. I mean, none of that is mentioned with those who did not take the mark, you know, either on the right hand or the forehead, and were killed because of it. None of that's mentioned. What does it mean? And hopefully I'm not doing boggling or bungling this up, but what it's really telling, I think, just on the face of things. Prima facie, a prima facie reading, right? Just on the face of things. When you read these texts, these are not describing the same events. They don't seem to be having, the, they don't have the same details, they don't seem to be pointing to the same time, they certainly don't seem to be pointing to the same people. They're not the same event. So, in other words, if you just let the word speak for itself, and as complicated as it, as it may seem, you let the thought that there are are three raptures be a possibility to you, suddenly confusion disappears. Because so many people have confusion about this passage and what we're reading tonight, and about the passage with the two witnesses, and about the passage about those who refuse to take the mark at the end of time. People get so confused about all of those things, and all of that confusion comes from one thing, trying to make them describe the same event. What happens if they're not describing the same event? Well, all that confusion disappears. When you just let the words in the text describing them stand on their own, dealing with the subject matter that they're dealing with in context, then that confusion disappears, they're all gone. Um, believing in three raptures seems like a crazy thing, but it allows me to let those words and those passages speak for themselves, and suddenly I'm not at all confused about the connection of the two witnesses in the tribulation period. I'm not confused about what's happening at the end of the tribulation. It, it makes sense and fits with other things that are spoken in other passages of scripture. And I'm, I'm not having this terrible effort of trying to pound square pegs into round holes. And that's what happens when you don't understand this particular feature of a rapture experience and why when you look at it, from the perspective of, of these three different risings of the dead, 
being at different places at different times, dealing with different people, therefore different events, when you don't see that, then you're left with a confusion. I say all that mainly because this is the case. People in the church are very confused about the expectation of the return of Christ. There are those who feel like the passage that, that trumps the rest of them is the passage that is the, the, the least, uh, what would we say maybe the, the, the most common denominator or maybe the, the, the least uh, suspect of being wishful thinking and they say, well, it's got to be that the rapture is going to occur at the end of the tribulation period when those saints that did not take the mark are raised from the dead, that's got to be when it happens. Well, if you believe that, you're a post-tribulation, you're a post-tribulationist, and a post-tribulationist believes the rapture, of course, happens at the end of the tribulation, and if you're one of those people, then you have to explain why the Bible tells you that we're not, we're not destined to suffer wrath, even though the Bible clearly describes those last seven years as being a period of wrath. God's wrath is going to be poured out on all the earth, on all flesh. Right? And the Bible says this point blank in very clear language. And yet if you're a post-tribulationist, what, what you have to assume is that God didn't actually mean those things when he had them inspired and written down for us. That, that somehow or another this, this passage dealing with these tribulation saints who did not take the mark at the end and get raised, that that is the thing that trumps everything else. Well, it doesn't. You just didn't understand that it's not the same event as anything else. Or there are those who look at that the passage with the two witnesses and they say, well, they get killed. They're laying in the streets, dead in Jerusalem, three and a half days. A voice from heaven says, come up here. Suddenly they jump back into life and go, whoop. Or maybe if you go through the sky, that, that's more of a touchdown thing, right? Whoop. <laughs> if you watch ESPN, maybe I should say, whoosh. <laughs> going up through the skies. Uh, anyhow, they go up through the skies. Um, <laughs> there it is. That trumps it. There is something that, 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 that's the thing, talking about the dead rising and going up in the sky, therefore, that's the thing that trumps all other mentions. This is the thing that's clear that we can hang on. Therefore, it's a mid-tribulational rapture. And they, when they say so, have the same problems that you do if you go with a post-tribulation rapture. It doesn't matter if you live, leave halfway through the wrath. How is suffering half the wrath of God better, better than suffering none of the wrath of God? Or how does that fit more with the text that says we're not destined for that? So there are those who believe in a mid-tribulation rapture and they think that, that the other raptures or the other uh, verses that talk about things that could be interpreted another way are just not clear enough to make a judgment on. Well, here's the problem. You, you, you can't throw away scriptures because they're not clear if you're trying to force some other scripture that, that shouldn't be forced upon them to be forced upon them. It's just confusion. And what happens? It disappears. The minute you say, it's not the same event. This is not the same event is when the, when the unmarked get raised from the dead, this is not the same event as what's here in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. So therefore, what's your conclusion, right? There's three of these. Three, period of, th three periods of time, and they make perfect sense in their own time for doing what they are meant to do. Right? The, the, the first rapture occurs at the beginning, the second rapture occurs in the middle, the last rapture occurs at the end. And it's basically different populations of people that are engaged and involved in each one. And it's all basically because of their condition of belief and readiness and what God has in mind for them to do during this period of time that dictates which one anyone will be. Go ahead, Bob. Okay, question for you. What becomes of the 144,000 that are sealed by God so that they are affected by this wrath? And all Israel, after the time of Gentiles, are saved. So what's their future? Here's, here's the way I look at that. The 144,000 will deal with them first. We're introduced to them in chapter 7. They're to we're told they're, they're marked, they're sealed with a, with a mark from God. 
that prevents any of the things that are happening upon the earth from harming them. Which, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna spend any time in wrath time, that makes sense. It's like God gives you a it's almost like, well, I, I was gonna say he gives you an asbestos suit, but the problem is that'll kill you. <laughs> that'll kill you too. So God gives them some kind of protective suit, if you will, in the sense of this mark, that even though they're on the earth, that none of the things happening as a result of wrath will harm them. Now here's the thing is, they're mentioned twice in the Revelation. We have them in chapter 7, we also have them later on in chapter 14. And here's the difference between them. If you look at either one of those statements about the 144,000, the first time they're sealed and the description of them clearly locates them on planet Earth. Okay? When we see them again, how are they described? Well, they're described this way. They're with the Lamb. They serve Him night and day in His temple. They never leave Him. It seems like even their dressing or their clothing has changed. They're singing song that no one else gets to sing. When I look at that description, I think, now what is this a description of? It's a description of heaven. It's a description of being with the Lamb. So, from the first mention of them to the second mention of them, their location has changed. This is why I think happens. I think that when the two witnesses go up, the 144,000 go up with them. Right? And you say, well, it doesn't say that when, when Jesus or when God says, come up here, you know, only those two are mentioned. That is absolutely true, but that's, that's the confine of what's actually being addressed in, in the, that text there. But when, we're, when it goes on and continues the story and gets to the 144,000, they've moved locations. And the only thing intervening that's happened that would explain that is the rapture of the two witnesses. And, you know, uh, what's going on in the 70th week? I've, you know, this, this is really not a part of our, our talk in Thessalonians necessarily, but, it, but it's part of the overall theme, so I'll talk about it. I'll dare talk about it one more time. What is the 70th week for? What is that, sep that last seven years period of time for? Well, we are told in Daniel chapter 12, or excuse me, Daniel chapter 9, very clearly the purpose of the 70 weeks. And it says there that those 70 weeks are, are basically put into place for things like eternal salvation, uh, eternal righteousness coming out, about sealing the, the, the word of God and prophecy, about making an everlasting end to sin. Right? So the 70 weeks are for doing basically this redemptive work with people. What, which people? For, it says, 70 weeks have been determined for you and your people and your holy city. So when we look at the 70 weeks, the, the Bible tells us what they're for, who they, are, who they are meant to accomplish something redemptive in, very clearly identified the Jews in Jerusalem. So what is the 70th week of Daniel all about that last seven years? It only has one redemptive purpose that, that is clearly uh, delineated in Scripture, and that is to make an end of God's redemptive work with the Jews in Jerusalem. So, the 70, or excuse me, the 144,000 witnesses sealed at the beginning of that 70th week all Jewish, their description is very Jewish. What must, why would God do that? Why would God seal these 144,000 Jewish people at the very beginning of that 70th week and then leave them on the earth in the midst of everything that's going on? I mean, it's really cool that they weren't touched by any things happening, but still, why would he do that? Well, it all has to do with unfinished work. The unfinished work he promised Daniel that he would make uh, everlasting righteousness be the end result of his work with the Jews and the Jerus uh, Jews in Jerusalem through seventy weeks, through seventy periods of seven years. Okay, and so um, the the, the 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 tribulation period that last seven years has one redemptive purpose on the earth, as far as God is concerned, and that is to accomplish and finish the work that He's doing with Israel which gets back to that second point, right, that you were talking about all the 
all of the uh, Israel getting saved. All of Israel is going to get saved through the 70th week. And what that means is the 144,000, the two witnesses. Now, where are the two witnesses ministering? They're in Jerusalem. Where are the 144,000? We're not quite told that specifically. They're just on earth. But um, they are Jewish. And so uh, he, when you kind of put all of those things together, I, I think certain things will jump out. I mean, even though it's not necessarily stated directly in the text, I think the inference is there that they're there to do that work, to accomplish that work. And so when that work is done, um, then all of Israel will be saved. Now here's the thing. It seems like when you get to the end of the, seventh, uh, the 70th week, the tribulation period, only... Only those who have not taken the mark are uh, raised from the dead. And you think, wow, that means that there are some Jews that were meant to be saved that will, leave, that will basically be unsaved at the end of that 70th week. Well, you could say that, but what I'd like to say instead is that, that I think that, that uh, I think that virtually all of them uh, will in one way give their life rather than take the mark. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a terrible thought. And it says that they'll either go into captivity or, or you know, they'll have their heads taken. But uh, nonetheless, um, it's, it's, a, it's a very real possibility that the way that it, it actually ends up getting accomplished, that all Israel gets saved, is that all Israel is put into a situation where they must, uh, they must choose God rather than, than life serving the Antichrist. Um, not a very good way to do it, but you know that's just the way that it works out in the end. And uh, according to Romans chapter 11, there's not a whole lot of doubt about the outcome of it. All Israel will be saved. And I think that's the way they'll get saved. And I hope I answered that, your question, Bob. Well, the other part of the question is, too, uh, we're, we're talking about all Israel now being saved. What's the next step with that? Well, once the millennium period come? Once, once all Israel is saved, and, and particularly in the millennial period, all of us who have been raptured, right, we're all coming back with Christ. Uh, and we will rule and reign with him for a thousand years. And so the whole point of us coming back with Christ as, as eternal beings is that we will basically help the administration of the entire world for the kingdom of the Messiah. The Jews will be um, basically serving him in the Middle East. Now, if we take... And this is kind of the way, way that I take it anyhow. If we take what Ezekiel tells us about this, this vision for a restored and renewed Israel that has never come to pass. If it's never come to pass, and Ezekiel certainly was someone attested to by Christ, it means that anything that Ezekiel said about the future of Israel that hasn't come to pass will come to pass. And basically, he describes a, a vastly extended and expanded Israel, and in which all of all of Israel will be living in the land promised, uh, basically, to Abraham such a long time ago. So that's that's what I think that the, that will happen once the Jews are saved. They are going to be restored to the to the land that was promised to Abraham, and through the millennium, they'll be administering that segment of ground, whereas the rest of us will be all, you know, all of us Gentiles, will be all over the world administering those places uh, in the kingdom of, of Christ um, until it's over a thousand years. Yep? So that, when you say third rapture there, when those that have to give up their life for Christ, do you think it's all Jewish or will there be any Gentiles possibly mingled there just because they wouldn't take the mark and they died. Now, uh, this is jumping a little bit ahead of ourselves in the study here, but I'm going to do it now because the question comes up and we can answer it. A little bit later on in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we are told why it is 
that the Antichrist is able to do what the Antichrist does at the end of the world. Sometimes when, when we get a sense of, when we hear that the Antichrist will have influence over the whole world and that uh, ultimately everyone will worship the Antichrist and everyone will take a mark and, and that, uh, um, that there's really, there really doesn't seem to be a whole lot of resistance to him. Uh, and we look at all that and it just like, that doesn't seem like it describes human nature as we've known it for thousands of years. What, what happens during this last seven years that so affects human nature that everyone gets on the same page, finally, right? I mean, it's like the Tower of Babel. God, God came down and looked upon that thing, what was going on. You had everybody on the same page, united in opposition to God. And God says, this is not going to work, confuses their language, and he basically puts that effort on hold until the 70th week of Daniel. Then in that tribulation period, that, that dream, you know, that was Nimrod's dream way back when, as far as human beings go, but it was really ultimately the devil's dream from way back near the beginning of human history to bring us all on the same page in opposition to God and His will. And now that happens because a strong delusion is sent upon them. And that's what it says, that's what Paul's language says in, in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Uh, now what that means is that God, God takes some kind of an action in the spiritual realm that causes all of the people of the world, and it says every single one of them, the language is all inclusive there, as we'll see when we get to that passage of Scripture and analyze the things that are there uh, with a little, a great more depth. But basically, it, it says every one of them, all of them, will suffer the delusion. They'll, they'll, they'll believe the lie and follow the Antichrist. And so when I read that passage of Scripture, and I see that it tells me that everybody's going to be on the same page and everyone is actually going to follow this. And when I say everyone, I mean every Gentile. The Jews have a different thing going. We've already talked a little bit about what's happening with them. But this is for everybody else in the wide world. Everybody who's not Jewish, they're all going to buy into the Antichrist. And the reason they do is that God ceases to grant us the wisdom to have discernment. God will, will, will cease granting human beings to be moved by the Holy Spirit, uh, understanding the Holy Spirit, all of those kinds of things. Uh, another way that it talks about it is in terms of the delusion comes, and in, in, in right in hand with that it says that the one who restrains will be taken out of the way. Now there's a lot of, a lot of different opinions about who is it that restrains. But here's what I think about that. He who restrains is us. Um, again, this goes back to, in some respects, in one of the things I find uh, in the book of Revelation, especially in chapter 4 and 5, where it starts talking about, about horsemen and seals and all those kinds of things. And I think that a lot of people really terribly, terribly misinterpret the first horse. The first horse is described in terms that throughout the rest of the book of Revelation, the same imagery is used over and over again. And for some reason, otherwise sensible brothers and sisters miss the fact that there is some kind of consistency in the use of those symbols. A white horse is never used for evil in the Revelation. It's always referring to Christ. It's always referring to good. It's always referring to light. And yet there are so many brothers and sisters who interpret the rider on the white horse as being the Antichrist. Let me just tell you, that's stupid. I mean, it's not slightly stupid. It's incredibly stupid. It's blindly stupid. And, well, forgive me, I probably shouldn't get on a high horse about it, but I'll get on the white horse about it. <laughs> it is in, it's incredibly stupid. It's one of the things that causes prophecy to not be understood. That interpretation does more damage to make things unclear about the end times than perhaps anything else does. If you understand that and say, what does the white horse symbolize everywhere else in Revelation where it's used? It's always about Christ. 
And if he's sending out a white horse on the earth, and it's described in the terms that it is, what do you have to understand that as? You have to understand that as the church receiving the Great Commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. What does the Bible, Jesus said things like, like you know, um, in, in this world, the, 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 the violent men are crushing into the kingdom of God and they take it by force. And he talks about things like, like the, the fact that we have got to be as wise as serpents and as harmless as dove. And he also talks about terms of uh, the fact that, you know, well, not necessarily him, but throughout the New Testament, terms are used about a warfare between us and the devil and, and us and the, 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 trying to accomplish the mission of God on the earth that he's trying to, the devil is trying to blind the minds of men and that we are, we're out there scrapping. We're out there trying to win souls to Christ. Well, that's what that white horse is all about. Okay? And so, um, I said all of that. I've, whose question was I answered right now? Was these? Yeah. Okay. And uh, the 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 thing about the, uh, the the thing about the 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 Jews in the end of the age and us at the beginning of the age is that we are the this Gentile church sent out to bring in the Gentiles. Sent out to bring now the Jews are coming in, but they're coming in by trickles. Here and there, not very much at all. We are sent out to win the broad expanse of the world. And when that is done, then the efforts switch. And everybody that's involved that had that opportunity, that, but didn't take it, what Second Thessalonians says is because they refused to love the truth and so be saved, that this delusion gets sent upon them. Right? And so, while we are here, we are the restraining force. The Holy Spirit in the church. The Holy Spirit inspiring and empowering that white horse. Right? While we are here, we are the great restraining... He who restrains. It's us. And if we're not here, then there's no longer any restraint. So now the devil has his opportunity. Now, what's the one-two punch? Take out the restrainer, and instead of sending spiritual insight and spiritual conviction and spiritual wooing and all of the things that the Holy Spirit is supposed to do, because now he's, he's out with the church, right? Instead, what do you have? You have devils basically running loose, and the, and the delusion goes upon it. And so the, the short answer, I've already been on the long answer, but the, the short answer is that that I don't think, I don't think there will be, I'll, I'll be surprised, you can never say never when it comes to God, he always surprises us. But I'll be surprised if one Gentile in all the world gets saved during the tribulation. And I'll, I'll be surprised because, number one, it says in, in Romans chapter 11, the full number, just the, the way that phrase is put across, it's very clearly a finite term that has a specific, uh, coherent, understandable, finite number in, in view. When the full number has come in, then all Israel will be saved. Uh, so, um, no, I don't think, I don't think Gentiles are, are going to be getting saved during the tribulation. And mainly because on what basis would they get saved? The restrainer has been taken out. They did not believe the truth when they had the opportunity. They, they loved the lie. And so God has basically given them over to this delusion. So instead of having, does anyone get saved apart from the Holy Spirit? I mean, Jesus said no one comes to me unless the Father draws them. And so, without the Holy Spirit, does anyone get saved? I mean, for, for each and every one of us who have been saved during this, you know, this age of the church, can we say, well, you know what, I woke up one day, and I was thinking about it, and I just, you know, I just decided that I needed to follow Christ. Well, we might say something like that, but it's never the truth ultimately, is it? I mean, the truth is, the Holy Spirit, He works this conviction, He works this wooing, He, he does this unseen work in us, and it's... It's plying us and prodding us and pushing us and carrying us along. And he'll use other things as well, 
you know, the, the white horse out there, so to speak. But if the Holy Spirit is not poured out on all flesh any longer, on what basis would anyone be saved? On what basis would they be convicted to bring them to that salvation? On what basis would they, would they have that, that interaction of the divine with our souls that causes faith to stir to life? How would they get saved? It's not, it's not like we can get saved on our own. We're broken and busted and totally depraved, as the theologians like to say. You know, what, by what basis would a human being be saved apart from the work of the Holy Spirit? And well, I, I think the answer is there is none. There is no hope for a human being to be saved without that work of the Holy Spirit being done. And when he who restrains the Holy Spirit in the church, taken out of the way, then the Gentiles are done. And the only thing that remains is what, what God is into and up to, and that's described in the 144,000 and the two witnesses.